He wanted to enslave the world. He unleashed a war that destroyed 30 million lives. He called that war a glorious and heroic struggle. And just before taking his own life, he said, I die with a joyful heart. His name is Adolf Hitler, and this is his biography. I'm Mike Wallace, this is Biography. Our story, Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler is dead, but the memory of what he was and the tragedy of what he did are too frightful ever to be forgotten. Why he became that kind of tyrant and how he was able to gorge himself on power and destruction is our story. It begins a quarter of a century ago. Vienna, Austria, 1938 the eve of the Second World War. Adolf Hitler holds the power of life and death in this city. Yet 30 years before, he shuffled through these same streets, a penniless and embittered vagrant who seemed destined for obscurity from the day of his birth. Adolf Hitler is born on April 20, 1889 in Braunau, an Austrian town on the German border. His mother, Clara, a former household servant, coddles and spoils her frail son. Under her influence, he becomes a choir boy at a Benedictine monastery. And young Adolf even talks about becoming a monk. Hitler's father, a customs official, is cold and domineering. When he hears that Adolf wants to study art, he snarls, an artist? Never as long as I live. Hitler is a troublesome, mediocre student, but he'll blame his teachers, calling them half-mad, absolute tyrants. At 16, he quits school, celebrates by getting drunk, and becomes a loafer for the next three years. Finally, Hitler is lured to Vienna, a city that sparkles with culture and pleasure. But not for Hitler. Through four humiliating years, he lives as a bum, in flop houses, eating in soup kitchens. While wandering the streets, he complains, hunger is my faithful bodyguard. He paints amateurish pictures and wallows in self-pity because he can't sell them. And then suddenly there comes what he calls his deliverance. Standing in a huge crowd, Hitler hears the official declaration of World War I. And he says later, I sank down on my knees and thanked heaven. For Hitler, the war is an escape from years of frustration. He said later, I went over the top with rejoicing and laughter. Soldier, he revels in the carnage. He recovers in a hospital after being wounded, and he is awarded the Iron Cross for bravery. But his fellow soldiers despise him for his twisted love of war. Hitler returns to a post-war Germany that is seething with violence. The German people are humiliated by their defeat. Riots and revolts flare as communist, socialist, and reactionary groups clash for power. As a paid informer for the German government, Hitler spies on a group of shabby radicals called the German Workers' Party. But instead of informing on the group, he joins it. Hitler finds an excitement in revolutionary scheming that makes up for the hollowness of his own life. Hitler is ruthless, a fiery street corner agitator, and he soon takes command of the party. Its name is changed to the National Socialist, or Nazi Party, 
and its program is designed to lure the disgruntled lower classes. Take from the rich, Hitler says, and help the poor. We must build a strong new Germany, he tells the defeated nation. When he speaks or writes, he is obsessed with words like eternal struggle, mastery, war, and blood. To be a leader means to sway the masses, he says, and I have no equal in swaying the masses. He organizes a gang of street brawlers, bullies, and misfits as his own private army, the Brown Church. Their job, to crack skulls, to terrorize political opponents. With these stormtroopers, Hitler becomes a minor but dangerous political figure in Germany. This new sense of power intoxicates Hitler. An incredible scheme begins to take shape in his mind. Although he has only a few thousand followers, he vows that he will personally overthrow the government. He will become dictator of all Germany. In 1923, after a political meeting in a beer hall, Hitler leads his stormtroopers through the streets of Munich. The national revolution has begun, he declares. But a detachment of a hundred policemen breaks up the march. And the fiasco, the Munich Putsch, ends in Hitler's arrest. The would-be dictator is tried for treason. He is convicted and sentenced to five years in prison. But through political influence, he serves only eight months in jail, in a private cell. And he writes a strange book called Mein Kampf, My Struggle, which is published after his release. It's a mixture of crackpot history, anti-Semitism, and his own fantastic scheme to rule not only Germany, but all of Europe. But at first, nobody pays attention to Mein Kampf. Hitler himself is looked upon as something of a national joke. For the time being, Germany is in no mood for a political hoodlum with a Charlie Chaplin mustache. But Hitler is determined to carry out his extraordinary plan and he goes about the task of rebuilding the Nazi party. His brown shirts are a special haven for deviants, thieves, blackmailers and murderers. They are his hard core. But in time, Hitler begins to lure thousands of followers. He promises to restore Germany's greatness, to build a mighty army. Only force rules, he says. Struggle is the father of all things. Virtue lies in blood. In the eyes of these people, Adolf Hitler is becoming a man of destiny. And as each day passes, he feels that the power he craves is nearly within his grasp. At the age of 38, this man of destiny develops a twisted passion for his 20-year-old niece, Geli Raubel. Neurotically possessive, he forbids her to leave his side to live a life of her own. And one day in 1931, the despairing girl commits suicide. Hitler is guilt-stricken, but he has no time for mourning. The moment has come when he must hurl himself into a power struggle for control of a collapsing Germany. Five million workers are unemployed. The weak, middle-of-the-road government is paralyzed by the crisis. Hitler exploits the emergency by fomenting demonstrations and riots. At the same time, the Communist Party unleashes a wave of violence, for they too plan to pick up the pieces when the Republic falls. Hindenburg, the president of the Republic, is 84 years old. His mind is failing, and the government he leads is hopelessly indecisive, corrupt. Although he detests Hitler, the ailing Hindenburg is forced to make deals and compromises with the treacherous Nazi party. After meeting with Hindenburg and his representatives, Hitler boasts, now I have them in my pocket. In 1932, Hitler takes a daring step. He campaigns against Hindenburg for the presidency. We do not need an uprising, says Hitler. Democracy must be destroyed with the weapons of democracy. 
But in a free election, the Germans still prefer a senile Hindenburg to a potential dictator like Adolf Hitler. Furious at losing the election, Hitler now resorts to violence to undermine the Republic and to increase his own power. His brown shirts start a new wave of political riots, even murders. In desperation, Hindenburg takes a fatal step. He tries to fight evil with evil. He appoints first one, then another political cutthroat to the key office of Chancellor, giving them virtually dictatorial powers. Iron rule, Hindenburg feels, may save the nation and prevent Hitler from taking over. But the new chancellors are too weak to cope with the crisis. Finally, Hindenburg capitulates to Hitler and presents him with the key office of chancellor. Hindenburg thinks he'll be able to use and control the Nazis and their leader. But Hitler has other ideas. February 27, 1933. The Reichstag building goes up in flames, put to the torch secretly by Nazi stormtroopers. But Hitler blames it on a logical scapegoat, his old rivals, the communists. He warns that the Reichstag fire and the current national crisis prove that Germany needs a strong leader. He demands absolute dictatorial powers, and this time he gets them legally, handed to him by the German parliament itself. A nation's freedom is surrendered to a tyrant. Said one historian, the gutter had come to power. But millions of Germans hail Hitler as the man who can lead them to greatness. The others are either afraid to oppose him, or they just don't care enough. Germany is now under his heel, but Hitler lusts for more. He vows to himself that all of Europe will be his, no matter what the cost. Adolf Hitler is dictator of Germany. He has surrounded himself with a hard core of ruthless lieutenants. Hermann Goering, a former drug addict, will become economic dictator of Germany and head of the Air Force, the Luftwaffe. Goering is an intimate of industrialists and aristocrats, but he prefers the company of Hitler's street brawlers. Propaganda minister and professional anti-Semite Joseph Goebbels. In his earlier days, as a frustrated writer and socialist agitator, he has attached himself to Hitler's coattails. Goebbels once said, Adolf Hitler, I love you because you are both great and simple. These are the characteristics of the genius. Rudolf Hess, Hitler's right-hand man. He is a former street thug who fancies himself a deep thinker. The ideal leader, says Hess, is a man who does not shrink before bloodshed, who can trample people with the boots of a grenadier. With such men, Hitler sets to work. The party is Hitler! Hitler aber ist Deutschland! Wie Deutschland Hitler ist! Hitler! Sieg! Sieg! must be burned, because ideas are dangerous. The nation's press and culture must be controlled by the state. All other political parties must be stamped out. The Jews, a helpless minority, are persecuted in the name of Aryan supremacy. Their businesses are boycotted, they're beaten up in the streets, they're driven out of public and professional life. Germany is becoming a nightmare state. Most Germans, however, prefer to ignore the mounting terror. Adolf Hitler is giving them what they want. He says he is a friend of the poor. 
He gives the unemployed jobs in public work projects, in armament production, It is true Hitler has smashed the trade unions and wages are controlled, but the working man now has economic security and he complacently surrenders his freedom. The industrialists embrace Hitler because they've been promised and now they get enormous profits from building the Nazi war machine. Germany enjoys good times. Few Germans seem to care that they have joined ranks behind a political gangster who is now ready to set up his move on Europe. March 7, 1936. A small Nazi force marches into the industrial Rhineland. This could be a suicidal bluff for Hitler. He knows that the French and British are not only strong enough to stop him, they could easily crush him and his entire Third Reich. But just as Hitler expected, his troops meet no resistance. The French and British are unwilling to risk war, a war they could easily have won. Elated by his Rhineland success, Hitler meets with Benito Mussolini, the dictator of Italy. He convinces Mussolini that together they can embark on daring military adventures and share in the spoils of war. With Italy as an ally, Hitler is ready to plot his next move. In the winter of 1937, Adolf Hitler holds a secret conference with his high command. He announces his decision to march on Europe. His generals are stunned. They warn that Germany is still too weak, that Britain and France can easily smash the German army. But Hitler can no longer control his ambition. March 13, 1938. Hitler's armies sweep through a helpless Austria. Once again, Britain and France do nothing. Hitler is sure now that he cannot be stopped. He makes a triumphant entry into Vienna, the city where he'd been a failure 30 years before. He is settling an old score. Adolf Hitler takes a perverse pride in the knowledge that because of him, all Europe stands on the brink of war. Munich, September 29, 1938. England and France desperately try to keep the peace. Britain's Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain and French Premier Edouard Daladier have come to meet with Hitler and Mussolini. Hitler demands that he be given the Sudetenland, almost one quarter of Czechoslovakia. Or, he warns, there will be war. Chamberlain wants to avert conflict at all costs. And he climaxes the long months of appeasement by throwing Czechoslovakia to the wolves. Hitler's appetite for conquest is apparently satisfied. Chamberlain returns to London without knowing that Hitler privately calls him a little worm. Chamberlain tells his nation and the world, my good friends, there has come back from Germany to Downing Street, peace with honor. I believe it is peace in our time. Yesterday afternoon, I had a long talk with Herr Hitler. It was a frank talk, but it was a friendly one. And I feel satisfied now that each of us fully understands what is in the mind of the other. Yeah. The settlement of the Czechoslovakian problem, which has now been achieved, is, in my view, only the prelude to a larger settlement in which all Europe may find peace. A dreadful 
darkness, however, is swiftly descending on Europe. The Soviet Union is the last real military threat that stands between Hitler and his plans for expansion. So in August of 1939, he makes a non-aggression pact with Stalin. A pact that stuns the world. A pact that leaves Hitler free to make his boldest move. smashes through Poland. This is the beginning of the most terrible war in history. Adolf Hitler tells his people that the Germans will be the best of the races, that he'll lead them to greatness with tactics like steel. The Third Reich, he says, will last for a thousand years. Adolf Hitler is committed now to a desperate course. Either he must conquer all of Europe, or he and the Third Reich will be destroyed. Adolf Hitler's tyrannical career could have been crushed in the beginning by the German people. Instead, his people followed him, and then his enemies appeased him. They helped this little man, this street corner agitator, in his climb to frightful power. And for this, they would pay a tragic price. Mike Wallace for Biography. <laughs>